The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew, the third chapter. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you do. And do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, let it be so for now, for it's proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. The Gospel of the Lord. Be I invite you to be seated, yes. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. In today's Gospel, we hear a voice from heaven that says, This is my Son, the Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. In regard to these words, I've been thinking about Luther's principle of grace alone, which leads me then to think about the whole principle of the three solas. Is that familiar to you? Three solas, three alone. Grace alone, faith alone, word alone. Like the persons of the Trinity, they are each and all completely integral and inseparable. And also like the Trinity, each principle is different from the other. Grace is not the same thing as faith and word. Faith is not the same thing as grace and word, and word is not the same thing as grace and faith. Each stands alone, as if it were the one dominant principle. Like love and marriage, they go together like a horse and carriage. And you can't have one. You can't have none. You can't have one without the other, right? You can hear Frank Sinatra just <laughs> singing those lines, can't you? And a driver, of course, you need to have a driver. You can't just have a horse and carriage, that would be useless. So taken all together, a horse and a carriage and a driver, they all transport you where you need to go. From glory to glory, as the scripture says. Anyway, when it comes to the words, this is my son, my beloved, with whom I'm well pleased. I do think about the idea of grace alone, because for me, the words are pure gospel, pure grace. They come down from heaven. They're publicly declared. They're like the blessings that we say during the liturgy or the absolution. And they remind me very much of God's covenant love for his son Israel in Deuteronomy 7. And this is what it says. You are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples in the earth to be his people. His treasured possession. It was not because you were more numerous than any other people that the Lord set his heart on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. It was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath that he swore to your ancestors that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who maintains covenant loyalty with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Those are just remarkable words to me. You are a people holy, chosen out of all the peoples of the earth, my treasured possession. I set my heart on you and chose you. I loved you. I kept my oath to your ancestors, and I loyally keep my covenant with you always. They are words that fly in the face 
of sometimes our all too often, all too frequent negative self-talk, negative self-assessment. God says, I don't care. I love you. Ostensibly, Jesus instructs John the Baptist that he comes to be baptized in order for them to fulfill all righteousness. Have you ever wondered about the meaning of those words? How is it that Jesus' baptism happens to fulfill all righteousness? Usually, John's gospel is pretty good about saying that Jesus did this or said that according to uh, an Old Testament prophecy. It's so that this prophecy can be fulfilled. And then he quotes the prophecy, da, 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 da. And yes, I have da, 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 da written down in my notes right here. <laughs> Yet Matthew is completely silent on the matter. Jesus is sinless and perfect to begin with. He's entirely human, of course, being born of a human mother, but Jesus has God, not Joseph, for his earthly father, so he's completely divine and righteous by birth. And if that weren't enough, we presume that he faithfully kept the Ten Commandments from his youth up. He probably kept even all 613 legal demands of the Mosaic Code. And if that's not enough, Jesus' lifestyle of doing good works proved ethically far higher than Old Testament law because Jesus loved the Lord his God with all his heart and mind and soul and strength, and he loved his neighbor as himself. So he really didn't need anything to be forgiven through baptism, right? And yet for all this, he still expresses his need to be marked by God's spirit through baptism, and that both he and his witnesses still needed to hear that public pronouncement of grace from heaven that says, this is my beloved son. My own delight, as it says in one translation. Words of status and favor for no other reason except he's a child of the heavenly father. I have heard it said that you can be right or you can love. At Jesus' baptism, God didn't need Jesus to be right. All God needed was for him to receive the imputed word, you're my beloved son, you're favored, you're mine, or this is mine, this is my beloved son. Grace alone, only and ever, is declared and received. And so I posit the pronouncement of grace was that completion of righteousness that Jesus said he came by baptism to fulfill. This is why Jesus needed to be received by God through baptism. It's why he need, had to be accepted by grace alone, which can only be given and never be earned. Jesus came through the same door that we all come through. Grace alone, baptism, words of declaration, being marked forever with the Spirit of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus comes down to the First Baptist Church of the Jordan River, and there Brother John immerses him. He comes up, he hears the pronouncement of grace. My beloved son, my delight, well pleased. Think about it this way. I love my children because I love my children because I love my children because I love my children. They don't have to do anything to earn it. I just love them. They can disappoint me at times, and they do, but nothing changes in terms of my love. They're my children. I love them. And so this all brings me about to a discussion, a brief discussion with you of what I think is the most important thing that I do on a Sunday morning. It happens at least three times during the liturgy, maybe more. I make a public pronouncement of grace. Sometimes it's a blessing. Sometimes it's a declaration of forgiveness. You might hear me following a prayer of confession say, Almighty God, who is rich in mercy, 
has given his only son to die for us and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority alone, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. During the words of institution, I get to declare God's grace on the elements of bread and wine and consecrate them to be the sacrament of the Lord's body and blood. In Luther's small catechism, he asks and answers these questions. What is the benefit of such eating and drinking? His answer, the words given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins show that forgiveness of sin, life and salvation are given to us in the sacrament through these words because where there is forgiveness of sins, there's also life and salvation. Then he asks again, how can bodily eating and drinking do such a great thing? And his answer, eating and drinking certainly does not do it but rather the words that are recorded, given for you and shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. These words, when accompanied by the physical eating and drinking, are the essential thing in the sacrament. And whoever believes in these very words has what they declare and state, namely, forgiveness of sins. Again, my point, by grace alone. We earn nothing by partaking of Holy Communion. Whenever we have faith in God's word about the sacrament, we have to ourselves the benefits that it communicates, forgiveness of sins and life and salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in the word alone. And finally, at the close of worship, I get to say something like this. I won't say these words this morning, but you've heard them many times. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. So what if at the beginning of worship or any time during worship, I should say, or say by way of alternative, as a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority alone, I therefore declare to you that you are God's very own precious daughter. You are God's very own precious son in whom God is delighted and pleased. It's exactly the same thing. The pronouncement of grace. It's what we all need to hear, truly hear, and receive into ourselves God's word of truth, of grace, of love, above anything else. So after I've finished the final amen of today's sermon, I invite you to take a little time and just simply receive the blessing that you hear God saying to you, my son, my daughter, well pleased. Lynn and I recently watched an episode of The Good Doctor, and there was a hospital patient who suffered on account of a secret battle that he had with bulimia. His younger brother, who was trying to force help on him for weight loss, had no idea about his brothers binging and purging. Eventually, it all came out, of course, because they're there in the hospital, the doctors discover this. And one of the attending physicians then says to the younger brother, sometimes trying to fix the problem is the problem. I went through tough times too. Plenty of people had ideas about how to fix me. I didn't need that. I just needed them to love me broken or not. Jesus wasn't broken in this sense or needing to be fixed, but he still did need to hear, needed for God to say aloud to him and to everyone, this is my beloved son, I'm well pleased. It's the same with you. Although it may be a good thing for you to be fixed up, to better love your neighbor and serve your neighbor, God, for God's sake, doesn't need you to be right or fixed. In relationship with God, all that is needed is for you to receive his own divine love that he has for you, his grace and favor. It's the only way for us to be righteous. It's the way that we get to fulfill all righteousness. Have God say it to us. You are righteous. God does it by grace alone 
on account of his overwhelming love. My daughter, my son, my delight, well pleased. Amen.